Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really happy to talk here in this Langbeck Wirtschaft, where I matriculated as math school student 17 years ago, and now we're here in, in this interesting talk. And learning objectives today will be to understand a little bit of, about pathophysiological background to perform the radio embolization, to learn about the really difficult technical requirements, and learn a little bit about safety and current evidence of radio embolization of either primary or secondary hepatic tumors. So we heard also in the talks before a lot about the rationality, how we can treat by embolization malignant tumors to the liver. This is because of the dual blood supply with mainly arterial perfusions of malignant uh, tissue and then the healthy liver tissue gets the support of the portal vein. And what is really radioembolization? It's, co it's called sel the selective internal radiation therapy using uh, yttrium 90 coated resin microspheres to treat unresectable <coughs> liver tumors by better radiation. This is really interesting because it's electron emitting um, element there with, with a low uh, distance going within the liver. And these microspheres have a specific gravity similar to red blood cells and are carried by f free blood flow into these tumors and have nearly no embolic effect. The yttrium 90 is a pure better uh, emitting part, um, electron, sorry, uh, element, and its penetration is not very far, it's only two and a half millimeters. And what is also interesting that, that makes it a kind of brachytherapy is that 94% of the dose is delivered within 11 days, as the half life period is only six and, uh, 64 hours, and the dose around. Uh, the probes is 40 times higher than it can be reached with external beam radiation just adjacent to the tumor. This is interesting because uh, we want a high dose within the tumors and a low dose in the healthy liver tissue, and we need high doses for the often ad adenocarcinomas like this here. We need doses of around 70 to 90 gray, but when we have when it, when we exceed a dose to the whole liver of about 30 gray, we really risk the uh, the radiation induced liver disease, which is really a, a heavy complication afterwards, which might kill the patient. So we are happy that we can reach a high dose punctually within the tumors and a low dose in the rest of the liver. What is also important that radium radioembolization is non-embolic, as we need the oxygen in the tissue to really let the radiation work. And this is reached by the free blood flow and the really small particles that are trapped to pre-capillary pre uh, level. Beta radiation does not go that far as gamma radiation, and it is uh, active at the, at the site of most uh, tumor growth activity. So we have, as I said, high dose within the tumor and, and low dose in the, in the rest of the tissue. And the particles are quite small. And by mean, they have a size of 32.5 microns. Which patients do we typically select for radioembolization? These patients have to have liver-dominant or liver-only disease. And we have to say that the liver is the life-determining organ in these patients. And Patients also have a pretty good performance status, up to ECOG status too. That means that they can serve more or less for themselves the rest of the day. And they have to have a life expectancy of more than three months. So we are here surely in a palliative setting. They have to have adequate liver function, because otherwise we would risk really liver failure after the embolization. And the cutoff typically is uh, 34 micromol per liter, or here in Germany often it used uh, two milligrams per deciliter and they have to have blood clot tests within normal range, and of course an informed consent has to be obtained. And in this speech about the consent, we have to talk a little bit of the potential toxicities of radioembolization, which is gastritis, duodenitis, pancreatitis, uh, um, due to male uh, embolization to other organs, and we, we try to avoid that by eliminating vessels uh, in an evaluation run, I'll show you that. Uh, another risk is radiation pneumonitis due to hepato hepatopulmonary shunting. Therefore, we do before embolization the scintigraphy scan with technetium marked albumin, and of course, the radiation induced liver disease. What about the workup? Before that, we have to perform a triple phase TC to, CT to determine vascularization, tumor, and non tumor volume, uh, portal vein patency, but portal vein thrombosis actually is no um, contraindication, and 
the extent of extra hepatic disease, as I said, it has to be liver dominant, and then the thorough and geographic evaluation follows with occluding multiple vessels. Here on, on this slide, we see how complex the anatomy is in the upper abdomen. We see the ciliac trunk um, with the uh, hepatic artery here and two major vessels who typically go out of the hepatic artery to the gastrointestinal tract, which is the GDA and the right gastric artery, which are always our major goals to, to occlude during the evaluation run. But it's not always that simple. We know a lot of varieties of the hepatic arteries. This is the most common common uh, part, the, the type 1, with the right and left uh, artery out of the pr um, pr uh, proper hepatic artery, but what, which is quite often is a replaced left hepatic artery. We, we could use both of these arteries to embolize, and also the type 3 one with the right of the mesenteric artery. But in these cases, where we have around three arteries, a right, a middle, and, and a left artery, our approach is typically to reduce it to two arteries, and then we typically occlude the middle artery, letting and develop some collaterals that we embolize from the left and the right artery to the liver. Here's now a case example. A lady, she's a nurse actually here in Berlin with hepatitis B. And she developed HCC and had a resection of a tumor here before and now a multifocal disease. She has just typical anatomy. Uh, I'll show you the extent before embolization. We have really multifocal disease here, and now the clips there from the uh, resection and indication was determined by the tumor board um, to do that. We wanted to block all the arteries and also wanted to eliminate the additional tumor feeding arteries, which is really important to obtain a complete embolization and complete radiation that no extra feeders are there, and we know th of the effect of HCC to produce or to, to go to extra feeders. So here we see the first angiogram. We have the ciliac trunk and really prominent uh, phrenic arteries here. And what we also see here is the right gastric artery, which is this small, tiny artery, which is sometimes hard to, to get. But here we are already see it on the first run. <coughs> uh, we went first to the right phrenic uh, artery, and we see major perfusion here of this right tumor. So we did the um, coil embolization afterwards to the right gastric coil embolization of this too, then to the GDA, starting here with coil embolization up to there. But sometimes, of course, uh, we have problems with these non-detachable coils. Sometimes they also can dismigrate, so we had to take them out again. But at the end, um, we could uh, inject pro without any problems the technetium-marked albumin afterwards. Patients have to go to nuclear medicine to undergo scintigraphy, and we see here the counts of in, with the gamma camera. We see that the majority of counts is measured over the liver within these tumors. And when, what they do here is uh, to make a uh, they divide the counts over the liver and, and the lung to to determine uh, the lung shunting on the one hand, which is important, I'll show you later, and also here in the, in the spec CT scan to exclude any extra hepatic um, embolization, which was not seen here. When we see extra hepatic um, enrichment of, of, of the albumin, we could also do a second embolization or evaluation run, and in the majority of cases, we, we find the respective artery, embolize it again, and then we can later uh, treat the patients. Then after that, um, a dosimetry has to has to be done to calculate the respective dose. Patients have to get the classical method is the body surface area method, where the body's, uh, patient body surface area is determined, the extent of tumor involvement of the liver and the percentage of lung shunting. Then the dose is calculated by this formula. And the classical approach is to reduce uh, the dose according to the lung shunt when we have less than 10%, this patient had only 5%, we can give the full amount between 10 and 15%. The dose has to be reduced about 20% uh, when, when we reach up to 20%, 40% reduction. And classically, it's said that over 20% lung shunting radioembolization is contraindicated. But we also use a different model that we calculate the dose going to the lung according to the lung shunting we had, 
when we have calculated the go dose going to the liver and when we do not exceed 30 gray on the on the lung, we, we also do uh, the radioembolization. In this way, we can treat more patients without seeing any significant frontalitis. Then afterwards, the therapy t is done, um, and after, after that, the Bremsstrahlung um, PET scan can, can be done to determine whether there has been good uh, deposit within these tumors. After three months, we follow this patient again. We see... Uh, already a significant reduction of multiple of his tumors. I can start again because here the tumor below the diaphragm there were quite good and even later after nine months it looks like this. The tumors became even smaller so in this case it really worked pretty well. We're not that lucky that it works always like that. But that, that's let us come to the evidence. <coughs> we have this year um, <coughs> presented at the ASCO in, in Chicago a lot of abstracts about ran of randomized trials uh, according to um, radioembolization. The first one I want to present here is, is the SARA study out of France. It was a prospective open-label uh, multicenter French national randomized control trial. And they, they uh, stratified patients into two groups. And one group got SIRS uh, microphase and the other group the, the classic serafinib. And, um, primary endpoints were overall survival, safety, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they had a sequential lobe of treatment, so they treated the first lobe, one lobe, the bigger lobe first, or the one which was affected if they had bilobal disease. Uh, second treatment was done after 30 days, and then, uh, and what was done, uh, they used the uh, classic BSA method I showed you before and not the other one. And when we see at the flow chart, altogether 496 patients were elig eligible, 467 were randomized. When we go through the chart of the third arm, a lot of patients were excluded, if died before, and but 52 patients were not treated due to um, <clears throat> critical anatomy or uh, lung shunting, et cetera, et cetera. And in the, in the serafinib arm, the majority of patients were treated. And when we see at the overall survival charts, um, then there was no significant difference between uh, the serafinib or the third group. Um, this is the intention to treat uh, population. So the one, uh, all, all these together, but also in the pro protocol um, population, there was no significant difference. What they found that there were significantly reduced uh, side effects. So. Uh, less skin rash, less fatigue syndrome, less weight loss, et cetera, but um, no si significant difference in overall survival. The quality of life was also significantly better for patients undergoing CERT compared to serafinib. There was another pretty similar study also presented this year in Chicago, the so-called Servanib study. It was performed in the Asia-Pacific regions they had a lot of centers uh, where they recruited patients and all patients were, were brought to Singapore where the treatment took place. The, the way they, they did it was quite similar to the um, study in, in France. Um, patients were randomized, got the CERT or the serafinib, but they also had a lot of patients excluded. Here there were 28% uh, percent of the patients excluded, mainly due to lung shunting and also due to unfavorable <coughs> hepatic anatomy. And the curves are pretty, pretty much the same like in France. They had no difference in overall survival compared to serafinib, but also less um, adverse events in the, in the third group compared to serafinib. <laughs> so they concluded that the primary endpoint there was not met, but um, uh, they had a significant better tumor response, which did not result in better overall survival, but less adverse events and less severe adverse events. When we look at other um, entities of tumors, here were the, the Foxfire um, the results presented also in Chicago. They deal about liver metastasis from colorectal cancer. This is quite often, as we already have heard, 40 to 50% of patients with colorectal cancer develop these liver metastasis, and the idea was to include the radioembolization in the Fox treatment as first line a therapy to improve uh, the local control and possibly overall survival. Altogether, there were uh, three uh, studies uh, brought together. The SurfWalks trial from Austria and New Zealand, 
Europe and Middle East and US, one study of UK and another one also from the rest of the world, and they had altogether 1,103 patients. Here, that, that's how they did it. They did the workup before the first cycle of Forfox, afterwards the radioembolization, and then patients uh, got the Forfox regimen with a little bit reduced dose and bevacizumab only at the end here after the fourth uh, cycle. Study endpoint was overall survival, secondary endpoints pretty much the same as before. And they have seen less uh, first uh, radiological progression within the liver in the third arm, but a more uh, extra hepatic progression in the third arm, um, and the overall survival is also not different. So that they concluded that the addition of third to Falfox in the first line regimen plays no major role. Um, and um, that toxicity here was high, so it's not recommended in the, in the first uh, line arm. But we will conclude um, that it's uh, not <laughs> life prolonging compared to serafinib, but less, it has even less side effects and therefore is attractive for patients that has le less adverse events. And in the palliative setting for uh, colorectal cancer, it's still plays a role because in the third. Um, <coughs> third line, there are not many options for these patients. Thank you very much.